The purpose of today's activity is to verify the thin lens equation. Last week I told you that the thin lens equation looks like this. 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. And you trusted me, as you always do when I give you an equation, you trusted me that the equation is valid. Today, we want to verify that that equation is valid. So our problem phrased in the form of a question, of course, is... Is the thin lens equation for a particular thin lens? We say a particular thin lens because you're testing one lens today, right? Not multiple lenses. Each group is testing one lens. We're going to have three variables, as always. Our manipulated variable, we're only going to have one of them, and that should become pretty clear to you as you go through the procedure. The responding variable, we're only going to have one of them. The control variables, we got all kinds of them, right? The temperature of the air, do you want to list that one? Sure, that's fine. Do I really care about that? Not so much. I care about the one or the ones that are critical to this experiment. What absolutely can't be changed or it will mess up this experiment entirely. And I think if you just give it a little bit of thought after we've gone through the procedure, it should be fairly obvious to you, like it usually is if you give it some thought. What is this going to look like? Well, every group is going to be given what's called an optic bench apparatus. That's a pretty general term for a bunch of different little things. Okay, what's included with the optics bench apparatus? Well, the first thing that would be included would, would be a meter stick. Also included with the optics bench apparatus would be two holders for meter sticks. You can only see one of them on here. There is one at the other end. They're just meant to hold the meter stick up so that you physically don't have to hold it with your hands as you're performing this experiment. In addition to the meter stick holders and the meter stick, you're going to have to have a candle and a candle holder, a lens and a lens holder, a screen and a screen holder. So these three things, the candle, which is going to serve as our object, the lens, which of course is critical to this activity, and the, and the screen, which we're going to see the image on, plus something to hold all three of those things on this meter stick. Does that make sense? All right. Here's how the activity is going to go. This procedure is on Google Classroom, so you don't need to write this if you don't want to. Okay, what I want you to do is first obtain the apparatus, and then very shortly thereafter, get the focal length of your lens. I showed you how to do that last week, right? You want to focus on a far-off object. Take the lens, put it on a meter stick, look at an object that's far off. we got a beautiful day today. It's bright sun outside, so the ob everything outside is, is reflecting lots of light. We should be able to get a perfect image on our screen to determine what the focal length is. Aim the lens at something far off, and then move the card on the meter stick like this back and forth until you see the image of whatever you're aiming at on the card. It will be upside down, but if you're aiming at something far off, then the distance between the lens and the screen, when you get the focused image on the screen, that will be your focal length. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion to you. Last class, we found that the easiest place to find the focal length was at the end of the hallway. We turned off the lights in the hallway down there so that where we were looking at it from, observing the image, was dark relatively dark, that is, and we were aiming at something far off like condos across the street or whatever the case may be, we, we saw a really good, sharp, focused image pretty quickly. It doesn't really matter where you do it, but bottom line is where you do it, the place you do it from needs to be fairly dark, and the place that you're looking at needs to be quite bright, and it needs to be far away. All right, so once you got the focal length of the lens, what are you going to do? Well, then you got to start changing the distance from the lens to the object. You need to start changing the distance from the lens to the object. We'll call that the object distance. Now, the way you're going to do that, though, um, doesn't really matter, but I'm going to tell you the best way to do that just for making things work the best. Technically, it doesn't matter whether we move this or this, that's going to change the object distance. But I'm telling you the best way to do it, to make this work the easiest, is to keep this 
in the same place for the entire experiment at the end of the meter stick. And then move this, move the lens. That's the best way to manipulate the object distance is to move the lens. Okay, it doesn't really matter if you move the, the candle, but it's easier if you move the lens. And then what are you gonna do with the card? Well, now you wanna move that back and forth until you see a focused image of your candle. You will not see the image at the focal length because the object isn't that far away, right? Our object is, you know, 15, 20, 30 centimeters away. Our image is gonna be formed in a different spot. So you're gonna to have to find a new location for the image distance that is not corresponding to the focal length. Then what do you do? Repeat it. Come up with a bigger object distance and then find your new image distance by moving the card. Step three or trial three, give me a bigger object distance and then find your new image distance that corresponds to that. Make sense? Be careful when you're measuring it. This will be your object distance and this is what you're changing, the distance from the candle to the lens. This will be your image distance. That is, whenever you find a focused image, that will be your image distance which of course is gonna change, but change in response to your object distance. When you're looking for an image, this is what you should see, a flame, right? Sometimes you're gonna see this, and sometimes you're gonna look at this and say, is that an image? If you're asking yourself the question, is it a focused image? The answer is no, it is not. If you've got what you're looking for, you'll know it. If you're not sure, then you don't have what you're looking for. That's a flame. This is just light. You're gonna always see light going through the lens. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a flame and it's gonna be upside down, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. Now, one word of caution I should have mentioned when I gave you the procedure. If your focal length is 10 centimeters, and for some of you, it could be, okay, the focal length for all of you is probably going to be in the range of 10 to 20. If your focal length is 10 centimeters, make sure your object distance is always greater than the focal length. I say that because if your object distance is equal to the focal length, there will be no image formed. And if it's smaller, it'll be virtual, so you're not going to see it on the screen. Make sure your object distance is bigger than the focal length. And for practical purposes, start at about five centimeters bigger. If my focal length is 10, make your first object distance 15. If your focal length is 15, make your first object distance 20, right? Here's what your data table is gonna look like. You're gonna have one focal length that you measure once and record once. This will be your theoretical value. This is what your focal length should theoretically end up being. You could probably guess what we're going to do at the end of this experiment now. Of course, you're going to have an object distance, image distance, and then you're going to repeat that. How many times are you going to repeat it? At least 10 times. You go more, that's great. The more data points you have, the better, but you want to have at least 10 data points. Once we have our data table, we're gonna change that data table around a little bit to create an analysis table, not DO and DI, but rather the inverse of DO and DI, one over DO, one over DI. Note the units there, one over centimeters or centimeters to the minus one. Then you're gonna plot a graph, one over DI versus one over DO or Y versus X. This is gonna be a straight line graph, but it's gonna be a little bit of a different looking straight line graph than you've seen before. It's gonna look something like that. Straight line graph though, you know what to do with a straight line graph, right? Every time we have a straight line graph, we can figure out what things mean from this straight line graph by, what's the equation that describes it? I don't care if it's sloping downwards or sloping upwards like it usually does, what's the equation that describes it? Y equals MX plus B, always. What's my Y axis get replaced by here? What's on my Y axis? One over DI. M is the slope. What's my x-axis get replaced by? One over 
do. But you got to be careful here. For all the other ones, guys, we've we've dropped the y intercept because it's been zero or so close to zero, theoretically zero. This one it's not. Pretty clearly there is a y intercept here, so you can't drop the y axis this time. Now we got to come up with an equation from our data sheet that has 1 over do and 1 over di in it. What is it? It's not rocket science to figure this one out. What is it, Chase? Yeah. Yeah. 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. Now let's just rearrange this to solve for the same variable, 1 over di. Looks like this. 1 over di is equal to negative 1 over do plus 1 over f. Now, some of you may say, well, I would have went 1 over f minus 1 over do. That's correct. The only reason I did it in this order is because that's the order that the first equation appears in. di, do, and then something else. We want it to look as much as possible like that first equation. And now we start crossing things off. 1 over di appears in both. 1 over do appears in both. What am I left with? The slope is equal to, anybody think they have this one? What is it? Negative, yeah, negative what? Negative 1. That's kind of wacky, right? Kenway, your slope will be negative 1 with your lens. Logan, your slope will be negative 1 with your lens. Okay, Rachel, your slope will be negative 1 with your lens. So that's not going to give me much, right? If we all get a slope of negative 1, theoretically, could be 0 0.99, right? But theoretically negative 1, that's not going to tell me much. So what I'm going to do is look at the y-intercept. The y-intercept will be equal to, anyone? 1 over f, right? 1 over do plus b, 1 over do plus 1 over f. That's what we care about here. We're going to say b, the y-intercept, is 1 over the focal length, or the focal length is 1 over the y-intercept. This is my actual value of the focal length the value that I determined through an experiment. So now we assumed that the equation was correct. We wanted to verify if the equation was correct. Well, basically, if the focal length that we just got from the experiment is the same as the focal length that we determined initially within 10%, then we can say that my assumption must be correct. In other words, the lens equation is valid. So go back and determine the percent difference by saying actual minus theoretical. over the theoretical value times 100. And again, your magic number, it's pretty arbitrary, but we always say the magic number is 10%. If we're less than 10%, we're good. If we're greater than 10%, we're not so good. Then, of course, you need your conclusion. Is it valid? How do you know? And your sources of error. We always want to have usually three good sources of error plus suggestions for improvement. Uh, but sometimes we let you get away with two good sources of error if they're really, really good. Ultimately, what do you got to hand in for this? Your problem, which I already gave you. Your variables, which I pretty much already gave you. Your data, your analysis, your conclusion, and then, of course, your sources of error, which includes your suggestions for improvement.